Okay, hello. Good morning. Um, so this is this is the session about SIMD lane support in GDB. Um, so I'm going to show some examples about how we do it in the downstream debugger for Intel GPUs, and then um, Lancelot will will take over. So we hope that um, we will show some examples. We we will try to keep it short, and then there there, there would be time for discussions. Yeah, and I guess like I, so. Hopefully the mic will catch up. The main objective of that is Intel does have a downstream debugger exposing SIMD lanes in the interface. AMD has a downstream debugger exposing SIMD lane in the interface. We don't do that the same way. But both of them, both of us, we are committed to have um, upstream GDB support for our devices. And so we need to agree and like with the community to come up with one way to do that in upstream GDB. And that's pretty much what this session is going to be about. So see the different approaches that we've had in the downstream, uh, downstream approaches and see what works best for uh, what works for everyone so we can go upstream. Thank you. Um, so sim delay support currently does not exist in GDB, uh, but for the code that's running on GPU, variables, arguments, etc., so they, because because it's vectorized, data needs to be displayed with respect to a SIMD lane. So that's the um, that's the essential problem. So essentially, uh, we think that well, we should display which lanes in a thread are active and selected because lanes can can become active and inactive depending on the the branch that's taken. Um, that's that's uh, that's a divergence. So, for instance, when a BP uh, when a breakpoint is hit, um, we say that the breakpoint was hit by, by, uh, with this thread with SIMD lanes, and then um, we show the active lanes. For instance, in it, it, those are even numbers apparently that was hit in a in a branch. So, not all the lanes are are active in that case. Or with the thread command, um, we should be showing the um, the selected lane because that defines the context. Um, switching the lane context um, is available in, in our downstream debugger via the thread, via the existing thread command. So it already takes a thread ID. Uh, we extended it with, with, uh, with the colon notation. So optionally, if you put colon and then the lane number, it will switch to that. And the, lane, the selected lane of a thread is remembered. So if you switch away from it, but then switch back to it, um, uh, th that lane will be selected. Here are a few examples. On the left-hand side, there is some code. I just cropped it um, for simplicity, just to show what's, what's running on the GPU. So, so that's the... Um, uh, that's the kernel that's being offloaded. The screen is unfortunately cut here. I was showing the breakpoint um, with an arrow. Actually, the breakpoint is hit. Um, um, one moment. It doesn't look right. Okay, that's better now. So the um, the breakpoint is is being defined at line 17, and then when we run the program, GDB says the breakpoint was hit by um, by this particular thre uh, thread with SIMD lanes zero through eight. So. These are the lanes that are active, um, and we prefer to display it using the range syntax because that's also a syntax that, that, that's being used in other comments in order to, for instance, um, give a range of thread IDs. So apparently there are nine lanes active um, in this case. The info thread comment, um, shows the thread ID in, in the ID column, it shows the thread ID plus 
it shows the range of active lanes, and with this asterisk, um, the selected lane is marked. So lane zero is, is the selected one in this case. Sure. Uh, so this I'm, one is this also being recorded? Shall we use that microphone? Okay. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so a quick question: uh, Is it possible in a breakpoint uh, to have a breakpoint condition that this breakpoint should only hit if a specific lane is active? Yes. I, I will show an example. Okay. Yes. Mm. So please. Um, Please be patient, and it will it will come. Yeah. So there is uh, there is the thread existing thread command. Our motivation was that we we wanted to make as much natural as possible these ex, uh, extensions. So thread command already exists. Uh, users are aware of it. So it's extended now with this colon syntax. Uh, the user can specify the lane, and uh, the context will will switch. In GDB, you can specify the thread ID using the inferior number dot thread ID. Inferior number is optional, so if it's skipped, um, it implicitly means the current inferior. The thread number, in this case, can also be skipped. It's optional. In that case, it means the current thread. So you can just say column 5, and it switches to lane 5 of the current thread, as, as in this case. And now that thread uh, lane 5 is selected, um, it's denoted here with, with an asterisk. Now let's um, put a breakpoint on line 18, which is the Dan branch. We do it here, and then we continue, and the, uh, the thread hits the breakpoint, but the previously selected lane, lane 5, is inactive in this lane. So only the even lanes are active. So implicitly now, in this case, we switch to an active lane, which is, well, th this is the default selection, and it's basically the first active lane. Um, and it happens to be 0 in this case. So. The, the thread switches the context to lane zero. Um, the th um, thread didn't change; only the only the lane uh, was switched. So that's that's why we uh, here we don't see a th thread switch; just the lane switch. Um, and like I said, the previously selected lane is remembered. So um, here we switch to lane four. And then we switch the thread. It's, it's it's a different thread. And then we switch to uh, we switch back to our current thread. And lane four is remembered. One question here is: um, Should we allow switching to an inactive lane? Currently, in um, well, I'm going to make things unfortunately a bit complicated now, but currently in the downstream debugger, we don't allow it. But the direction is yes, we should allow it because if you go to upper frames, in the upper frames, that lane may be active. Or uh, it could also make sense that you switch to an inactive lane for some reason, and from the perspective of that inactive lane, it should still be possible to, to evaluate things that don't rely on that don't depend on uh, the lane context. And um, with that, the UI will have to, will have to change. Um, in this case, for instance, InfoThread would have to say, OK, that's the, that's the selected lane, but it is inactive. And then the active lanes are shown. Um, I actually have. Mm, markings. So this is the selected lane, and then uh, there's a set of active lanes, um, and then there's the SIMD width, so that the user gets, uh, gets this information.
those are the basic things about displaying um, active lanes, switching the lane, uh, etc. And then there are some extensions make to uh, make to the existing comments, like the break comment and thread apply. Break comment already takes a thread clause. It's basically like a condition. So it says hit this thread only for this thread, uh, hit this breakpoint only for this thread. Um, we extended it to also accept um, lane specification. Um, in this case, we, we, would, we would only see which one of those lanes. So that's to answer your question. The thread apply uh, command also takes a range, um, a list of thread IDs. Um, by default, its behavior is preserved, and for each thread, the, sp the, the given command is executed for the selected lane. So there's on, it, it would for each thread, it would be executed only once, and it would be for the selected lane. But <clears throat> now with the extension, it's also possible to specify SIMD lanes. Um, you can use the asterisk in order to say, okay, it should be applied for each active lane. You can give a range syntax or there is all lanes. Here are some examples. First, the break. I said here, okay, I, I want a break point at line 18, four, lane six. It could be a range, but I, for simplicity, this is a single lane in this case. And then when we continue, we hit that lane and, and switch to that context. Although the, the breakpoint is also hit for other lanes. Some thread apply examples. In this case, I want to print the, uh, uh, the, the elements variable with the asterisk um, notation. Now the command is executed for each active lane of the specified thread. With the range syntax, we thought that, okay, if the user gave us a range, may they probably want all the lanes in this range. So we execute the command for active lanes in this range, but for those that are inactive, we give a warning. Um, and then, like I said, the, the, um, the default behavior is preserved. So if you don't specify the lane, it's only executed for the selected one. And the all lanes, there is thread apply command already has an all keyword, which applies it for all threads. Now all lanes does it for all threads and all lanes. So it would be a, it would be a long output. Uh, we define two convenience variables, SIMD lane and SIMD width. What is the current SIMD lane can be queried with this convenience variable or, or, or what is the SIMD width, um, um, it can be queried. And then there are some MI extensions. I, I think these are now getting into some lower priority issues. The, 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 the basic stuff would need to be, I think, um, agreed upon first. But just to give a context, um, we extend, we added a dash dash lane argument for MI comments with which the lane context can be specified. For instance, if you do stack list locals, it gives you um, the, the, the values of, of the local variables. But you can specify the lane context. Um, and then you get the behavior, you get, you get the values uh, based on that context. All, MI already has a dash dash thread argument which, with which um, the ID would usually specify the thread context. Um, when there is a stop event, we added three new fields. Um, what is the SIMD width? What is the execution mask? The execution mask is, is used in order to understand the active 
inactive lanes and the hit lanes mask. These are the lanes, mask for the lanes for which the breakpoint was hit. It doesn't need to be the same as the execution mask because maybe the breakpoint had a condition and the condition does not necessarily hold for all the lanes. And there are new MI comments to query um, the width, execution mask, and hit lanes mask. And you can, because these are com MI comments, you can specify the threat context so that for, for, for an arbitrary threat, um, the, the property would be queried. This is just a summary slide. Now I would like to, unless you have questions, I would like to um, give the stage to Lancelot. Yes, please. Would you, yes, please. Throughout the whole presentation, you're talking about SIMD lanes, and yes. throughout the whole presentation, you're, what you're describing is SIMT lanes. Can, is it too late to fix the terminology? Because I'm super confused by this. <laughs> I don't think I can fix this terminology by myself. It's a very big topic, I'm afraid. I mean, there's no divergence in SIMD. It's not a thing that can happen. Uh, SIMT has this, it, this. Uh, okay. It's the same hardware, different uh, mental model, and I'm just finding it usually confusing. I wish, <clears throat> I wish there was common terminology it's confusing. Um, I understand what you mean. Yes, you're right. But I, I, I think I understand what you mean, yes. But yeah. Just drop a word. Just have to because of this confusion. Just, OK. Just, we, we just say lanes. It's fine for, I, I think it's fine, yeah. <laughs> you take yeah. the microphone. Uh, yeah. So you're going to say on slide, one slide. No. Um, so very quickly, uh, thanks, Paris, for, for, for the presentation on how that's done on the Intel downstream uh, part of GDB. And just have a quick look at how we do on the AMD side. And then we can have a discussion of, you know, on what we want for upstream. So just a um, quick introduction and some properties of what we call lanes in the AMD GPU world and like what we can expect of them. So we use them in a, as we said, uh, SEMT execution model. So that single instruction multiple threads, which strictly speaking is implemented with pretty much the same, same kind of hardware. If you have anything that's CMD like and you have an execution like a mass predicate, you can do CMT. Um, that's just a way you map your source language to, to your hardware really. Um, so in, in, in that model, we will have multiple lanes executing what is logically multiple threads, and, but they just execute what we call in lockstep. So there is one PC for the entire lane. And when you execute an instruction, someone might or might not be active at a given point in time. Um, some properties we have. So we have fixed uh, the waves. We have, have a fixed number of lanes. And that's going to be uh, you know, fixed across the entire lifetime of, of a wave, but that can change in the same architecture from one wave to the next. So it's going to be 32 lanes or 64 lanes. And that depends on, on the architecture and the configuration. At a given time, like a, a wave, depending on the uh, predication mask, mask can be either active or inactive. And we, use so, we also define what are unused lanes because those are lanes which does not map to any thread like in in this in the source language model so they're never active basically um so the way we map that in in our downstream gdb basically we do introduce a new first class citizen object which is a lane the same way we have an inferior um and threads and inferior of threads, threads of lanes. And yeah, that's a completely, complete new object. And we have a couple of more for queues and dispatches, but that's not really going, 
going to be too, too relevant here. And so the same way we have for info inferiors, info threads, we have info lanes. The same way to select an inferior, you have inferior, the inferior number, or thread, the thread number. We have lane and the lane number. number. And we do have the same concept of what's the current lane. And on that subject, I think most of it is going to work pretty much the same as as is working on the case for Intel. So uh, when you hit a breakpoint, and so that's going to select the thread, and usually that's going to be selecting the first active lane and that, all, all that kind of stuff. And that's pretty much the same way when you select an inferior well, by default. If you don't specify anything, that's going to give you the first thread by default. Um, we also have a couple of convenience variable, um, pretty much for the same. So dot underscore lane is going to be the current lane number. And lane can give you number of lanes. And we have a uh, notion of lane divergence. Uh, we'll come a bit to that later if we have time. Just for a quick reminder, so like the, the language we map to, um, to a device, that's usually heap. And just to go really quickly, if that's the host side, we don't really care about that for now. We have the kernel side where basically that function is going to be mapped. Um, that 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 function is going to ex be executed for every element in a given 3D space, like space, and each one will handle one element. They're going to be batched together in waves. One wave is going to be mapped to a thread because, like, one PC, and one lane going to execute one instance of that, of that function. Very briefly. So, how does that look in GDB? So, as I said, waves. Like the anti waves are mapped to threads, um, yeah, to GDB threads. And we have the, the, that con concept of basically um, we're dealing with a unified process. Like everything is just living in the same process, so everything lives in the same inferior, and that's pretty much, much unified. So if you have multiple inferiors, not really the case here. You can select an inferior, you do in for threads, and you will have all the threads for that process. So that you will have threads that are executing on your CPU and thread that, or waves, we call them, that are executing on the GPU. Uh, don't remind too much about like all, all, all the lane IDs and everything, which does give some information about, you know, where in that 3D space that's the, the wave are, li are, are living. I guess we can ignore that for now. So, info inferiors, um, info threads, and then we can, from here, Select the thread within the inferior, do info lanes, and then we have the, uh, a list of all the lanes, which will say uh, tell us if lanes are active or inactive or unused by default. I think the unused are not going to be shown, but we can still show them. And we have the lane command, which works exactly as same as thread command, which select like sets what's going to be the, the current lane. So that's pretty much we take what exists in inferior threads and we apply it to new objects, which are lanes. Then, so we have one PC, like almost all exceptions are going to be reported at the scope of the, of the thread. So when you have a breakpoint, like all lanes are going to be stopped. So the entire wave is going to be stopped. But pretty much the same way as we are, as Barry's just showed when you hit a breakpoint, all the lanes might not be active. So GB will tell you we just you know we hit a breakpoint and that was it. You know on thread six by lane like 18, 20, 22, 24, like a set of lanes that the set of active lanes uh, basically. The same we can have um, conditional breakpoints, so we can have like break somewhere if like only for lane eight if you want to do that and that's what going to happen and i think i have a typo because i asked lane eight and it said like lane 18 but that's a typo that's not how it's really happening sorry for that um yeah and then so instead of you know extending thread apply as it was done we have a lane, lane apply that works pretty much the same so in the context of the current thread you can use lane apply and that will apply a command to a uh, every lane so here i have 
line lane one to four, you can ask only active lanes, all lanes. Um, we have switches for that, basically. Um, and like a so quick word on yes. Yes, sure. If it's that, if that's on the mic. Yes. Um, so now there is thread apply, and our approach was to extend it with the ability to to also specify lanes. Now in 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 this approach, there is lane apply. Yes. If I if the user wants to apply a command to let's say all threads and all lanes, would it be like thread apply and the command would be lane apply? Yes, you can do thread apply, dash dash, lane apply, uh -huh. dash dash, and your command, and that's going to apply to every lane of every thread that you've selected. Okay. And then I guess but that, that's going to be the same for, for your syntax. If you specify a, you know, a set of lanes, they might not all be active in all the threads you mm. apply. So, uh, yeah, but you, you can you do thread apply, give a, you know, a pack of threads, and lane apply to all the active lanes, that's most probably probably what you're looking for. So mm -hmm. you, that's how you would do it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so the people not too far from here, we can probably bring the mic. You're close yeah. enough to have the mic. Everyone further, th uh, I'm sorry, that's, that's the best we can do. I just wanted the mic. <laughs> No, uh, yeah. So one one advantage is of the split approach is that you can then have a very clear spot to where to put extra arguments. So you can have thread apply minus stopped to filter only stopped threads, and then lane apply only active. So thread thread apply minus stopped, and then lane apply active, and then finally the command. And you have can contain completely different arguments. It's not all mixed in the thread command where you have some options that only apply to threads, some options that don't really make sense to lanes. So you have a clearer separation. Do we have other questions or do we carry on to the end? I don't have a lot of stuff to, to cover and then we can go on a lot of discussions. Um, so a quick word on line divergence and the way uh, basically we we um, like that how that divergent uh, divergent workflow work, works. So if you have a function, you have a conditional um, like a if then else kind of statement. Uh, what's in the if uh, is not going to be you know to evaluate the same across all the lanes. For th some of them, that's going to be true. For the other one, that's going to be false. And the way it's uh, implemented, and that's true for pretty much uh, everywhere, I guess. When you execute the the, the condition that would set a prediction, um, uh, like the ex what we call the exact max mask, and that mask will have one bit per lane. If the bit is set, that means that the instruct all the vector instruction will have an effect if that bit is zero that means that um the instruction is effectively a, a, effectively a no op and so another way to look at that is every lane so wh when when you will execute every lane will execute both the um, then and the else block and we just switch the exact mask which means that everyone will go to if block some of them will execute an op if they were in. This should be in the else branch. The other one will do actually something. And when we get to the else block, we just switch uh, switch the map mask. Some execute an op, and some execute something. Um, and so by default, if you like map that directly to GDB, you can have some surprising behavior because you select the lane at some point, and you want to step like call next, 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 or, or, um, or to um, go through a function. And then you here, you have a, a condition. Uh, I don't remember if it's supposed to be true or false here. Um, doesn't really matter because you execute it, you end up in the else branch because our compiler just put the else before the if, if just the implementation detail. And then you do next and you still, you end up in the else branch, in the then branch. So you've 
apparently executed both the then and the else branch, which is really counterintuitive. And the way we approach that is because we have a context, uh, a concept of an active lane, and that's the one we're tracking. Um, we have a support for what we call um, divergent, divergent lane support, which makes GDB ignore the stop if the current active lane is uh, is is inactive when when you go through the um, the code. And if you active that, uh, and that's going to be activated by default usually, um, you execute your condition, you could do the else, and when you continue basically behind the scene, GDB will continue stepping all through the then branch, and you end up with like an execution flow, which is quite um, expected. And I think that's pretty much everything I wanted to go over so far. Um, we do have some MI extensions. We do have some work going on with um, like to so for inactive lanes, in, like we have a concept of virtual PC, so that for a lane which is currently inactive, if we have the proper debug information, we can compute what's going to be the next instruction where that lane is going to become active. So when you do info lanes, the lanes which are actually inactive, we could end up showing them as, as if they were already at the next instruction they're going to execute, even though they're not going to execute right away. So there are still more to that, but that's not really, that, that's not a prediction just yet. So um, just stick to like what we have so far. And now the question is, where do we want to go upstream? And what, what do we want lane support in GDB to look like upstream? And all okay, questions. A, well. a bit, a bit of, of a detailed question. But yes. could, you, could you move back to the pr to the previous case where we stop everywhere? Yes. So if the lane is inactive, we step and the lane becomes inactive. Yes. Is there any switch or do we stay with the inactive lane? No, there is no switch. We will switch if there is an event, like there is an exception, there is a breakpoint. But unless there is an external mm -hmm. event, we are not going to switch if we okay. detect Disable the diverg divergent lane support. Okay. We we have um, just for the record we, we have the same uh, same opinion same agreement uh, for for this behavior. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Because the one of the um, I don't know if you said it earlier because I sorry I missed first minutes. Uh, one of the main goals here, and I think this applies to Intel as well, is to make debugging uh, this style of code, one of the goals is to make it uh, look as close to debugging CPU code as possible. And remember that lanes are mapped, at least in the heap model, are mapped to some concept of lanes, uh, oh, sorry, are mapped to some concept of threads in the programming model. Uh, when you're programming in HIP, each lane here is mapped to what's called a HIP thread. And it, when you're focusing on a lane, you're looking at the variables specific to that HIP thread, which in hardware terms are, is mapped to a lane. So it's one-to-one. -one. Uh, it's just the word threads is ambiguous. Yeah. So you always have to qualify. GDP thread is mapped to the whole hardware thread, whereas a hip thread, the logical programming level unit is mapped to a lane. Yeah. So when you're programming and debugging your code, you're thinking in terms of the programming model. Uh, so we make the debugger do the same thing. So you're looking at the variables for your hip thread, meaning you're looking at the variables for your lane. You're debugging your lane. So when you step, you want to keep your focus on your hip thread. You want to keep your focus on your lane so that's yeah. why this is so intuitive in that model. You don't have to understand that there is divergence magic happening. There's an execution mask. Uh, you're just you know, following your thread, your lane. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And just for the naming of things, uh, for those who are familiar with OpenCL, and I think SQL should have the same terminology, Watch what Pedro just called a heap thread is going to be called a work item usually. So. We can call that a uh, work item and so far as HDB threads, we'll have multiple work, execute multiple work items at once. But when we debug, 
we still want to focus on one work item because that's that's where the focus is and what's that's how it's been programmed where, when you work the kernel you write the logic for one work item at the time and then it's just an implementation detail that it happens to be vectorized and executing on the entire this SMD execution unit i i have one comment and and one one question the comment is um this um more intuitive approach that uses virtual pcs and and so on so it's something that we i mean we don't have support for for that at the moment and um we we believe well this is an option so we believe that this this um, this could uh, this should be something that the user could configure but having the the other the next one the next option as the default um like like the amd chose um, makes sense so that, that's yeah. the comment i have a question but you have i think something to say for this topic well i agree so you can then answer, <laughs> answer your question <laughs> so the question is uh so i just mentioned that in the hip model we have the concept of a hip thread but is that the case on sql or is that not the abstraction because I, looking at the code i see you have a for each oh, then you pass a, a functor into the for each that seems to not be the case that it creates something called a sick thread sickle thread right. can you talk about it yeah so in yeah in in sickle yeah there's there's no concept of a sickle thread instead there is there is the there's the task that is being executed and it's for a work item index so there is this concept of work item uh, which which maps i think this is a this is common um, in this domain so it it maps to the uh the the logical input domain the three dimensional grid it, it yeah Can you in SQL ask in, in code, get current work item coordinates or something like that, or get yes, current yeah. ID for my current task? Yes, you can ask for the, the input to uh, the Lambda, which is the kernel, is a work item index. And through that, um, it's possible to query the global yeah. location, global size, local index, local size, etc. So these are programmatically possible. And in the debugger, um, we make them available through um, convenience variables. Yeah. Yeah. So basically, instead of what you have in CUDA or OpenCL, where you get those information via intrinsics, on SQL, you get that as a, you know, a like mandatory first argument that the kernel just gets. Um, just in, in hip, what, what's the difference, or is there a difference between a hip thread and a work item, other than saying that a hip thread works on one, one work item? Yes. Is, there, is there more properties to a thread than just which work item it works on? So, uh, coincidentally, is that this is coincidentally, yeah. uh, hip threads are very similar to CUDA threads, so that's the programming model. So there was somebody that decided to call those threads. And then there's a different standards body, OpenCL and the HSA Foundation, two, actually two different bodies, yeah. but shows a different terminology for the same thing. It's just different ways to call the same thing because different people. Maybe on HIP, the concept of a thread is more prominent because from all the code that I've seen, which is not much, just a few examples, and test cases in the GDB test suite that I might have picked it at your repo, uh, are typically a C++, when then you pass a, a lambda or a functor. So we don't see something like spawn a kernel with this number of waves, right? Where on, on hip, that's what you do. You decide how many threads, how many hip threads the yeah. the work will be divided into up front. Oh, that does exist in SQL. You have ND range. You can sub, like, 
like the mm, parallel for yeah, like correct me if I'm wrong, but parallel for is just a mostly sy syntactic sugar and a short end to submit an ND range kernel where you would specify number of work items and the number of of you know that number of work items per work group and number of work groups, but we still have the same concept, like SQL comes from OpenCL where that, where that exists, and that exists, and that's exposing the programming model. Yeah, it's... it's so you, to the Lambda, uh, the, the programmer can pass a range, and that range can be up to three dimensions, and that would be the the range for the for for I mean the, the dimensions and range for the um, for the logical dom data domain, um, and then the runtime does the splitting. To the lambda, there is also an option to pass um, a subgroup size, which would specify basically. I mean for GPU especially, it basically boils down to the width. Um, the, uh, uh, I won't say SIMD, the the width of lanes. Yeah. So that that's that's the mapping to hardware. I go there; it's easier. Uh, yeah, I would suggest that you just come. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, right. and I though I do have other questions for you, but. I don't know. Do we do we have other questions? Because I think most here we're working on GPU stuff. We do have. Some background and some bias, I guess. Um, are there any inputs from less biased people, I, I would say? Yes. One by one, they all come here. <laughs> and never leave again. <laughs> Hotel California. So, um, so maybe not as much unbiased as ignorant, but it's not clear to me uh, if the the mapping like AMD and Intel have the same model of uh, GPU thread. Like, um, I don't know, for instance, in the AMD, it seems that each, I don't know, process thread, CPU thread can have its own GPU threads. I don't know, maybe that's what it's looked like from the way you, you say there's a hierarchy. And in Intel, it seems like it's something else. So that I, I still, don't see how they relate. Um, in our ap approach, GPU threads appear in a separate, in another inferior. So there is, I mean, the, the distinction, the split is done by which inferior uh, the thread belongs to. In in the AMD approach, th yeah. they are all together in the same. Do That's you want to everything answer? in the same inferior, and also because the programming model it's one source, and like there is a concept of there is just one address space that's used across everyone, and that's why we map everything in, inside the same address space because they are. That's not granted for for all allocations, but many you can make an allocation and you will have an address that can be read and written from either the, the CPU side or the GPU side at some performance implications, but you can do that. And so we do have that concept of, yeah, there is one big memory address space that everyone can, can share and use. And that's why we map everything inside the same inferior. And when, when you write your code, you write like one program. And that seems uh, like the, why we map that inside just like one process, one inferior in, in GDB. I think there's, and, yeah. Yeah, just adding that. I don't think those are pro like the both approaches we have are too incompatible uh, because like when we get to the lane and like I guess the most the, the main difference we have so far is when you want to select the lane do you do lane X or do you do thread column X? Uh, yes. That was my question. All right. So in terms of of model, it's all very similar and uh, we we stole ideas from each other actually, so it's not a coincidence. Um, and uh, I was I was asking about the programming model. If you expose the thread IDs and all of that to understand how common things are, so it seems like you do have that concept of uh, yeah, the task ID or something. So, so even more common than I thought. It, this is all the differences are just basically presentation. Um, it's how do how do we choose to expose this to the user in GDB? 
because the, the hierarchy is the same. The inferiors have, have threads, and then threads have lanes. Lanes are specific to that thread, GDB thread. Then it's a matter of presentation. The fact that um, they have separate inferiors and one is the host, the other is the GPU, that's more of an implementation detail than a difference in the model. They also have a shared address space between the two inferiors. Um, the question, or not the question, but or, or maybe, maybe it is a question, is how do we want to go forward in terms of presentation to the user, how that, to let the user see which lanes are available for a thread, how to select the one you want to look at. Uh, in one approach, it's integrated to the, thread, uh, to the thread concept, GDB thread concept, with a new syntax to specify the thread and lane ID. The other approach is lanes are a first class object. So you have info lanes, a lane command, lane apply. But which, how, how to go forward? One, okay, I mean, there would, we, we will find of course pros and cons, but one thing that I would like to ask is, for instance, if the user wants to switch to thread tens lane five, so in, in our approach, in the Intel approach, they could do thread 10, dot, 10 column five. Would it be thread 10 followed by lane five in the AMD approach is? I think that's is, is the how that's advantage. implemented today. The ID, and I think we just forgot to implement that, but yeah. with B, the same way when you want to select like a thread, you can do thread and thread number, and that would select that thread in the current inferior, or you can do thread inferior dot um, thread number, and the idea would be to do the same with the lane. If you do thread uh, lane X, you select lane X of the current of the current thread. If you do lane X dot Y, that's going to be thread X lane, lane Y. And you, if you do lane X dot Y dot Z, that's going to be inferior X thread um, thread Y and lane Z. So lane one takes a thread ID as the argument. Oh, it doesn't today because. It was implemented in a to-do and stayed yeah. there. <laughs> so that, that, so that, that, that's, uh, that's oh, it should work. Um, it's not implemented that yeah. way just yet. But the idea would, yeah, that would be an extension of the same way thread work. And you can optionally specify an inferior to select a line. You can option, uh, you should be optionally able to select so a thread and maybe an inferior. The thought process to come to that design which we implemented after seeing yours. Uh, so kudos to them, they had something working first. Um, was the command you use always specifies the finer grained thing you're selecting. So it's inferior one. The word inferior matches the number. It's inferior n, inferior one. Imagine in the future we could have something above inferior you know, imagine we split the number space for inferiors per target, right? So you'd, you'd have to do target one, inferior one, target two, inferior two. And then you could imagine that we'd have oh, yeah. inferior 1.1, one one, inferior 2.1. So the last number, the N, is always ma matching the word, the action word. So thread one, so thread N, the N is the thread, but it, then you can fully qualify, append things to the left. You can do thread i for inferior dot t for thread. But the last number is always matching the word, the action word. And then lane is the same thing. If you want to select a lane, it's lane l. But then you can fully qualify it. So imagine you can do lane i dot t dot l for inferior thread l. But then the, the word, the action word always matches the left, the rightmost number. And this has in my mind, one advantage for the future, which is think in terms of we want to expose something like fibers to GDB, which are user space level threads, which nest under thread. So if we, how do we then expose that to the, to the user if we are already using some syntax to specify a subset of the thread using the thread command. How do you, do you use a different symbol? Like you've already used colon 
for the lanes. So now if you want to specify the fiber, you have to come up with a different symbol. So it seems like if you go to that world, you would have a fiber commands and you would say fiber one or you do fiber t dot one for, for the thread. So that, that was the thought process that led to this different function. Make sense? Yeah. Um, yeah, and another thing was, does it, I hope it doesn't sound like I'm drilling or something. <laughs> Hmm? No? Okay, so just one other thing that I don't think you have a mapping uh, to that. Maybe you do, and I didn't see it. So when we do info threads, the target ID string is yeah. GPU, wave, and th that number. But when we do info lanes, can you show the lanes? Yes. See that it's different, and the numbers seem like the same at, this, at the first sight, but they are not. They're, they're actually different coordinates. It's, it has more information. Uh, um, I think there is a bucket slide. In could you? Means. Oh no, I cannot show a bucket slide. Could, could, could you show info threads again? Um, should be that one. Yes. So um, one one decision we made here for info threads was to show the selected lane, and the motivation there was that. For instance, the frame arguments are shown from the perspective of the selected lane. So it has made, made sense to make it clear in info threads what the selected lane is. Um, this doesn't exist here, or am I? Mm, no. I we don't show mm -hmm. frame arguments. Uh, we do. We just do the same yeah. thing. Yeah. selected. The first lane. Yeah. I yes. think it's a selected lane. Would, would, just, yes. Like, uh -huh. Would it make sense? I, I think we, we, I mean, we think that it makes sense to display it. What, what do you think? I'm not, uh, I think it makes sense to display it, but I'm not sure it should be the default. Maybe it should, maybe it should. Yeah. So, what might be a bit counterintuitive is like in that particular case, what we write is going to be the same for all the lanes because that's like the default argument. If you can do info threads and see some values in the argument um, that are not going to be consistent across all, lane, or all of the lanes, that might be um, counterintuitive. So we might need, mm. like uh, the, um, the other way to do that would be just to say where the piece is. So you, you see the kernel and you don't specify what the values are. And that would be different, yes. But we still need to see, say something. So I guess even with with divergence, uh, it can make sense to show in like like this in which function where that the wave is stopped in reality, like the physical using the physical PC. And if there are multiple arguments, well, no, just there are arguments that we can show. Uh, we can evaluate them, but then if, if the argument is not lane specific, meaning if push lane was not involved in computing it, we can show it. Otherwise, we can show it's like a param equal and then just lane specific so that you know that you have to do like a particular lane to see the value. And if it's shown, it, shown it's because it's valid for the whole wave. So that, that can be an approach. Um, we, we, we do exactly that. If if the argument value depends on the lane and the lane is inactive, that will be in, within angle brackets. There's an there's a small error message that indicates this. I didn't mean this exactly. I meant here, we like in the MD display, we show we would like to show the frame information, but something that's valid for the whole wave. Whereas you know, right now we evaluate the. The arguments for the selected lane, which you know can be confusing. Oh yeah. Mike. Okay. Take the mic. Sorry. Uh, I I'm saying that I I do not remember if we in info threads if we select the the active one. Sorry, the last selected lane for that thread, or if it's just the first one that is active. 
yeah, could I'm be either. Sure. I think Andrew had a question. Yes, but oh. different topic, changing the topic, so finish. Yeah, but so, because we're pretty yeah, much at the top of the hour, so. So I have yeah. the exact opposite problem to what you guys have. Uh, GCC is producing SIMD, like true SIMD code that runs on these things. Yes. And quite frequently, we've got scalar values in vector registers. And you can ask GDB what's in variable i, and it will tell you, but then it will give you 63 undefined, val undefined values as well. Um, is that a deficiency in my deep? Sorry? No. No, no, no they do have a, a this compiler. Is GPU, of course. This is AMD yeah. GPU. Yeah. So uh, I, I say, you know, so I'm, uh, so the, the AMD architecture doesn't have a full scalar instruction set. Quite frequently, you end up with scalar values in lane zero of yeah. the vector. And in GDB, if I ask what the value of that is, it will tell me, but it also has a bunch of undefined values that go with it. Yeah. Uh, is that a deficiency in my deb debug info, or is that just the way that it works for now? Is that when you print a variable, or is that when you print the content of the register? Uh, no, the register works fine. Uh, the register, yeah. register works fine. Uh, yeah, the, the variable. So sh then shouldn't the debug information say that's going to be in vector x? Yeah, but we're not, using, we're not using any, yeah. of your expect, any of your dwarf extensions, because that's that, yeah. Yeah, you, but, but, no, but I, I guess mean, we know just, what the mode of the value. Yeah. We know what the mode of the value is, though. Right? I, I think. It's yeah, but even like you're not emitting the, yeah. the right. Yeah. So there is yeah. dwarf for that. Yeah, but and like it would the, just the, print the, one value. You yeah. can do a composite and just take four bytes out of that register. Right. Yeah. Okay. It That's seems probably like the, the dwarf. Uh, it sounds like the dwarf is saying. This variable exists in register yes. V1. And it's yes. it's done. But it says what, what type it is, doesn't it? Yeah, but it doesn't say which lane it is. So, and then the next thing is that sometimes I have 32 lane, uh, sometimes I have 32 lane vectors, sometimes I have 16, 16 lane vectors, sometimes it's eight lane vectors, and, but it all just shows me all of them. Again, is, uh, I, I, this is something that needs to be in the, the, the can, does the, the, the debugger support that if I were to get the, uh, Dwarf uh, Riot? Um, I think in Intel's, pr there is an Intel proposal to, uh, to have a uh, DW or like SIMD with that yes. would specify that. Yeah. Yes, the SIMD, SIMD width uh, attributes yeah. for, for to, to specify the width. But yeah. I don't think we really have hardware support for that because. Like, what's going to tell you that is going to be uh, like the execution mask that will tell you what's active or not active? Yeah, but no, that's, meaning, that's meaningless. The exact yeah. mask, you, you could tell if you're set on a breakpoint on that exact instruction from that. But any other point, the exact mask could have random garbage in it. I mean. <clears throat> yeah, but if you're using, like, if you're just using 16 lanes out of, like, the, the full register, don't you just set 16 bits in the exact max? Yes. So the yeah, no, if you're stopped on a breakpoint, you can see the exact max, but at no other time are you going to know what it was, what it's going to be. Yeah. So the, there's the, the, the dispatch mask can tell the SIMD, uh, the width, but also not for all the threads, because some threads may, may be assigned, like, the end of the range, which may not yes. be full. So their dispatch m mask in that case can all, cannot be used as a SIMD width. The, I mean, the, the idea that we took was to, to let the compiler specify this in the WARF as a, as a SIMD width attribute. I need to use the dwarf extensions to express this. And I'm having trouble getting any patches. Well, I mean, I haven't tried for a few years, but yeah. getting patches accepted that use dwarf that doesn't exist was a problem when last I tried. Yeah, but. The variable lives in this register, but at this offset. You don't say the, the, the size, because the size comes from the type, but you need to say where it starts, which lane it starts. And this is part of the extension. To be able yeah. to see which yeah. So I, and without the extension, without but. the full extension, because like I don't think you need the full, like the full. Um, it doesn't need that because it doesn't react lanes. Yeah. There is no SIMT here. And there is no yeah. divergence. There is there are <coughs> there, the the exact yeah. register doesn't exist as a as a, as, a, as a as a as a mode. It's you know it's a it's a parameter on a register. It's, it lives that long. <laughs> 
there's a parameter on an instruction, right? Yeah. You go the three, I mean, the three is, I'm, okay, maybe I don't have the full understanding. Now, the SIMD width can be specified as, as an extension in the WARF, and there is this push lane operator, and with the push lane operator, the compiler can actually um, compute the offset. If it is solvable, I mean, the, the comp composite locations are not necessary. The push lane can, it, it, it is, is sufficient for the compiler to compute the offset. But lane yeah, support, but, I mean, yeah. and upstream lane support does not exist, so that's the topic. Yeah, but <laughs> so anyway, I basically my question is, and specifically for Rockham, because Rock GDB is what I'm using. Yes. If I were to put some effort into getting GCC to produce more detailed dwarf, would it have these features that I want to show smaller values in these huge registers? Uh, yeah, uh, you like if if. If it's just plain CMD code, and yeah. you want to describe the a thing you subset need to do. of a register which is known by the compiler, should be able to do Mark that. Knows everything and knows yeah. this variable is put in this piece of the vector register. Then instead of just saying the location of the variable is the vector register, you would say you would build a composite and say uh, piece. There's this piece operators support. Yeah. You say it lives in a piece. And then you specify which part of it is the And you say it lives in this register, but at these bits inside the register. Yeah, and this is one of the dwarf extensions that. No, this exists. No, that's WAF 5. Okay, okay. So the design is not great, but I think that should work. You should have everything that you need in dwarf 5, and the extension we implement in RockGDB are backwards compatible with that dwarf 5, even if we change the semantics of the evaluation. Dua 5 should still give the same results, so okay. that should work. <clears throat> thank you. I mean, I don't, I, this is background text, but yeah, I, 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 I expect you. it. If that doesn't, please reach out and we'll try to find a way. Uh, I'm sure we can. So, thank you, Maris. Thank you, uh, Lancelot. And uh, lunch? <laughs> no, but for, for, for that. Lunch, I guess um, we can continue. I guess. Discussion. Yeah. If anybody's interested, I don't know if we can start, but we have, uh, if you're interested in the topic of lane stuff and maybe the dwarf extensions to support that, we do have a, a meeting with your MD people, Intel people, uh, and people from other perforce. Or that. And uh, kind of try to add these things out and you know prepare extension submissions for the dwarf committee, uh, but also more. So if you're interested, then you could join us and you know ask these questions, same that you did, but in that forum. Yeah, uh, and would that be too weird? I you? guess like the ne next step is probably to start a RFC thread on the GDB patch mailing list, so we can like continue the discussion and. Maybe get a broader audience. Basically, as do we want thread, X column, lane, or do we want lane? Uh, because that's that's going to be the main difference, I guess. Is that or we continue to talk a bit? I know of the list. If we can get to the list, is probably better. And one way to move forward uh, to think about, which just came to me right now, could be useful to discuss this right in one minute, is what is a subset here that is common and that is not, uh, you know, there's no disagreement that we can consider upstreaming and, and would that help? Like the concept of a lane existing and that being the current lane, uh, yeah. And they do approach, like if we wanted, they, they don't conflict, like they could add a lane domain to their debugger we could try the, the syntax, like, we could just like, they could implement our approach and vice versa, and then see if it works, and then we have like two implementations, so when we send the stream, it's like right. proven out, proven that it works for both of us. Right, and by doing that, we, it's easier to see what the differences like it, are. It'd be easy for you to implement info lanes, I guess. Just borrow yeah. the code, right? Just copy our code. Like, to be lanes for lane comments? Yeah, uh, sorry, nothing for you, but well, well. Yeah, oh. 
I mean, I, we, we will... Whatever the, the outcome is, I mean, what, whatever the decision is to make this convenient for the users, uh, that, that would be what we would follow. I, think, I, I, I don't think we would want two things. Um, Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. Maybe we can end the session, but we can continue. Yeah, I think we can end the session. Everyone feel free to have lunch, and yeah. we're going to be more than happy to continue discussing that either here while we're here or later on the mailing list, or no, either on the mailing list, offline, whichever you prefer. Thanks, everyone. Over lunch. Thank you. Have a good lunch.